Hello, everyone. Hi. Um, OK, let me see. OK, this works. Cool, yeah, my name is Kuba. This is actually my second time giving a talk. I had one last year, uh, so an equally fun topic. Uh, yeah, we actually had a, a correction to put up there because the bottom title is what was formally printed in documents and these are the writing conventions applied and the top is how it's supposed to be because Unix. <laughs> okay, so let's see, does this work? Cool. Uh, I'm not going to bore you with details about me. You can look them up on my last year's slide. Just go back in time, search my name. You can learn a little more, a bit more about me. Uh, so, what are we dealing with? We're dealing with a $10,000 coffee machine that is very serious, very big. It's probably as big as this pedestal would be. Um, it can do pretty much everything. It can put, lo put up lots of different types of coffee, lots of different drinks. Uh, it can take money, it is connected to the internet in some way, <coughs> and it doesn't have a cup dispenser, automated one, so that's, that's a big problem. It will detect a cup being placed, but it will not give you a cup, so that's, that's, that's the only thing it doesn't have. Okay, so we unplug the machine, we plug it back, and it's a PC. So that was the first Eureka moment. Okay, so now that opens a lot of possibilities, doesn't it? And now that we see it's a PC, and when I learned it's running Linux, because that came up later in the boot process, then I got busted at work for trying to do this. Uh, my only option was to go all the way to the top and ask for permission and, uh, and <laughs> promise to put a lot of money on the line in case it broke things. That was uh, kind of one of the conditions, okay? So after getting the approval, everything was much more open and I acquired the official key. This is the official key I had, but you can just buy them on the popular online retailers, very easy. Uh, so, uh, later when I had more time to play with it, uh, I took a peek inside, because why not? So I took the covers off and I removed the front screen and uh, so this is the front panel we moved. Uh, zoomed in, you can actually see, I'm gonna this we have a serial port plug here, uh, power somewhere here, a compact flash uh, pretending to be a drive just over a serial adder port. Uh, very ordinary PC as far as things are concerned. And there's another look to this here uh, power uh, SATA that goes kind of to the compact flash cord. And that little thing is a wireless keyboard that I've uh, added to it later to make it easier for me. Yeah. So, this is the other board. So this is actually uh, that 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 you can see when you open the whole thing out with the official key. Uh, this is the control board. So it has a lot of uh, triacs here, I believe. Um, high power, high voltage. This is not something really safe to touch. That serial cable I mentioned it ends here. So that was very useful later. Um, then this little thing is the firmware side of that control board and that compact fl flash card would have been accessible from here from within underneath the board. So this is what actually makes the coffee. So this is what controls all the solenoids, the heater, the dispensers and everything else. Uh, so let's see, um, let's, let's see what, what we can do with this, okay? So I had it opened up, I knew it runs Linux, I knew it connects to the internet because there was a little Wi-Fi icon on the screen that wasn't on. Uh, so I pulled out my uh, Novena laptop. I've actually added one Ethernet port outside of the machine to make it easier for me as well. Uh, set up a network bridge, just capture some traffic. It reports to this particular uh, server somewhere somewhere on the internet and it simply puts up an XML file with the status. It, there's nothing special about it. It seems to be reporting just the ingredients or the status of the machine. It doesn't really allow any remote control. So you cannot make coffee remotely. That was a bit drawback of my research at this time. Uh, yeah, that's my upgrade to the machine. It, it comes out of the back. Now, uh, once I had the traffic captured and the bridge uh, yeah, so here you can see the uh, DNS entry and response basically trying to go back and forth. And there's a snippet of the XML file that it sends out. Uh, relatively simple troubleshooting. This is the XML file fully decoded and fully formatted to make it look nice. The MAC address has been redacted. 
but everything else here, and the serial number has been redacted too, but everything, it just reports what this machine is, that's it, and that's about it. Very simple. So now, now that we know the, uh, the user visible parts, or, or the invisible parts, uh, look into the Linux that it actually runs. So there were two machines I dealt with. One was the, there was an older one and a newer one. The newer is the one that didn't have Ethernet port. The older one actually had a socket on the back that they didn't have to upgrade. Um, it, the, the older one ran Slacks, and the other one ran Lubuntu, which are basically popular live CD distributions of Linux. Uh, the software in that coffee machine that, that runs on top of Linux is just simply a Java app with a UI that just plays videos and captures clicks. Uh, so th what do you do when you get access to a Linux machine? Well, you look at the passwords. So I looked at the password and a shadow file, and that was something really strange. So what was wrong, right? There was um, that, I'll, I'll tell you later what this was, but here I'm looking at this hash, very long hash, and then I'm like, this, this doesn't belong here. Okay, the A is the F. That there, there shouldn't be anything before the salt in a password hash. So I'm like, okay, I'm just gonna remove that and see what happens. So, uh, John the Ripper exited in like five seconds. I thought something was wrong, but uh, no, the password was this. This was the password in the machine. It was obfuscated by just adding some stuff to it. So now that I had a password and a keyboard dongle added to the machine, control of one to escape the X windows and go to the terminal. Uh, I added a couple things, like added additional user admin. That was the one that I masked out in a previous slide with a UID zero so that I could ac access to the machine anytime I wanted. It didn't have SSH, by the way, so that's something I didn't want to enable. Uh, so I talked about a serial port being somewhere there and a cable that goes all the way to the back uh, to the controller. So I drove up to Fry's, that was a few years ago, uh, while they existed, and I got a 1054Z Rigel scope quickly, and for some reason Fry's just sold them with all the options available, which was actually even better, because the serial, port, serial, serial decoder was what I needed, really. So I started the capture process. So this is me, kind of, these are the probe cables over here and a bunch of probes here, like four, four, four was perfect. Uh, four probes on a four channel scope was exactly what I needed to capture all of that. This is, looks really messy, but that's how I got all the data. So, this is how it looks on the screen. This is a serial communication. Um, I don't remember which, which is which in the, at this point, but uh, that was basically me capturing the serial port. So this is the boot process. When, they, when you unplug the machine, plug it back in, this is how it talks to the controller to check if it's there. And it does that a lot. So now I kind of clean it up a bit. I actually turn the proper decoding and we have some something, right? Whatever this is, that's what we, uh, we I can see that. So this is like a response and a, and, and a transmit and so on. So uh, I had this real port sort of available to me. Um, so I said the software was written in Java. Java is surprisingly easy to decompile. So I poked around, and if you look carefully at the string 570700, uh, I'm gonna forward, and then we have 570700. So I found the same exact string in the Java. So that proved that all of my research from the actual wire was accurate, okay? So I had the very important string. This is basically how it initializes the machine. There were a couple things that I've added to it just to mess around, but uh, this was basically the, the initialization string to the controller that it sends to the controller. So now, now that I had uh, all the information, I had a Java source, I had a protocol decoded, I had a file system available, a couple user accounts added, and a bunch of other features. Uh, I'm like, what? I was just thinking, what can I do now? So the best thing I could actually do, and somewhat practical thing I could do, was to use VirtualBox to run that Linux image on a virtual machine on my computer. Uh, but then it just dies instantly uh, because it couldn't communicate with a controller that wasn't present. Uh, so I'm like, how do I emulate? Well, VirtualBox make it, makes it extremely easy. You can emulate a serial port 
by just connecting it to a TCP socket. So I wrote a simple Python script that will just do that for me. Since I had the initialization string and a couple communication protocol uh, snippets, that was all I needed. So this is my Python code, a little messy, but this is me sending that same string in hex into the serial port in a while loop, just to keep it simple. Uh, so this is basically pretending to be the controller, the control board. Uh, so that's how it looks in a VM. We have a main controller. We had some issues here. Like a main controller ID, it was like I didn't provide it, so it just didn't look like anything. It was just some random garbage. Uh, and then this would never end, okay? These are like a progress dots. It would just never end. It would never s continue to the further stage. So that wasn't great. So I did some more digging, uh, and I, I actually realized that the for probably for safety reasons, because you're dealing with a lot of power, a lot of heat in the machine, and a lot of you know heavy solenoids and, and other hardware. This is very sensitive to timings. If there's anything wrong, and if there's any tiniest mismatch or any signal that maybe the control board is, you know, something happened to it, it stops for safety reasons. So that's why it just wouldn't ever continue doing this. So I did some more cleanup, I did some more timings, and this was be me basically doing this is the second attempt that was fully successful. Uh, it actually responded with an OK, which was good. Uh, and I don't have the next screen here, but you can see this all running within VirtualBox virtual box, uh, within a VM. So that made it through. And then it basically goes to the welcome string that you've seen on the first slide, effectively. Um, so. Well, what's the practical, practical side of it? I said there is no cup dispenser. There's not much you can actually do, okay? Um, like I already mentioned that the serial protocol is very strict. You actually cannot make espresso. Like the minimum amount of liquid that's dispensable is like 118 milliliters, which is like three times the espresso. Maybe that could be tweaked, but the ordinary screen doesn't allow for that. So there's really not much practical stuff you can do. Uh, so I just kind of started pondering of like with different ideas. Uh, you could possibly write an open source controller. Uh, like you can, you can do this on both ways, right? You could use a different Linux distribution, different OS to drive that control board. I think the most of the logic on, of verifying whether the machine is safe to use is on the PC side. So the control board will just take whatever commands you send to it and it will make you whatever you ask it to. Um, so you could probably still use a different OS or different machine to do this. Uh, my other idea was to use like a face recognition to click that the menus for you. So that would be kind of fun. Like you walk to the machine and it just tells you, it makes the coffee that you want. That would be kind of fun. But not automatically, unfortunately, because of the cup dispenser. Uh, and while I was at it, I actually found an Easter egg. And the Easter egg, let me see if I can bring the actual demo. I don't have the real machine. The Easter egg looked like this. <laughs> it was in a machine. This is called, the file was called Mega Man Dancing, which is actually Mega Man Headbang, available on the popular internet. They so can look it up. Uh, so I dissected the file. There's like nine, nine uh, frames to this animation. Uh, and I did some more digging. Uh, and I, I've determined that this file basically shows up when you're in like a super user mode. So if a technician comes to service the machine, that's what they see, which is fun. But that doesn't, that's not really user facing, unfortunately. So you don't get to see that. There is, doesn't seem to be any way to make this appear. Okay, so uh, that's one. Uh, and then I think the most practical thing I could really do was to put some excise on it just for giggles. And this kind of follows your finger as you click through the menu. Um, uh, one other thing that I, that I found is that uh, these serial port strings that I've identified, uh, they're very easy to look up in the Java code. And it basically uh, retransmits that about three times with instructions of like which solenoid to open, how much heat to dispense, how much water to dispense, which ingredients. Uh, and basically, the recipe that you can make, uh, it's in a very big XML file, which I don't have here, didn't want to pull to the screen. 
uh, that XML basically alters the temperature and the amount of ingredients. So it's kind of fixed and then it just substitutes a couple of these when it sends it to the controller. So it's relatively simple uh, as far as that goes. Um, what else did I find? Um, yeah, I think that's about it, uh, actually. Uh, well, I actually found um, one more reference to the fun uh, Easter egg. I found a badge on the add-on board that's also a Mega Man, so I borrowed it uh, for this for the purpose of this talk. Uh, if you have any questions, I'm here. Uh, if you want to talk more about this machine, that would be fun. Uh, and one more interesting fact, um, the beginning of the title of my talk, which is Pseudo Make Me a Coffee, Pseudo happens to be a legitimate last name in Japan. Imagine that. Wouldn't that be cool? So that's about it. Thank you for attending.